patient is placed in the lateral decubitus position with the extremity in a positioner to statically hold the arm in abduction and internal rotation to allow for adequate access to the posterior axilla. A 6 to 8 centimeter incision is made along the posterior aspect of the axilla and is taken down to fascia. With this technique, the repair is done through one incision, so the humeral aspect of the incision is for exposure of the humeral footprint of the latissimus, so that incision remains relatively constant, whereas the incision towards the flank is for exposure of the retracted tendon and can be extended as needed. Gelpie retractors are used at both ends of the incision to tension the soft tissues as dissection continues. A mixture of sharp and blunt dissection is used to identify the latissimus and teres major musculotendinous complex, which oftentimes can converge into one tendon prior to inserting onto the humerus. Here, as dissection continues, we are getting closer to identifying the tendon as we encounter its seroma cavity and we see the seroma fluid accumulating. Dissection continues towards the humerus. At this level, it is important to identify and preserve any branches of the posterior brachial cutaneous nerve, which is visualized here. A Richardson is used to retract the triceps and the posterior brachial cutaneous nerve posteriorly. With a mixture of sharp and blunt dissection between the triceps and the pec major, the ruptured latissimus tendon is identified. Next, we mobilize the tendon. Alice clamps are placed on the tendon to allow for tension as the ruptured tendon is mobilized with blunt dissection until it can be readily approximated back to its humeral footprint. Some sharp dissection is used to dissect adherent fibrous tissue. Once the tendon is adequately mobilized, the arm is maximally internally rotated to expose the intertubercular groove of the humerus. Right angle retractors are placed anteriorly on the pec, which also protects the biceps tendon and the radial nerve, posteriorly on the triceps, and at the apex of the incision to facilitate exposure of the footprint. Any stump of remaining tissue on the humeral footprint is debrided, and the tendon is provisionally placed over the footprint to determine if there is adequate mobilization, as shown here. Next, the cortical bone is abraded with a curette in order to stimulate a biologic healing response. It is important to note the proximity of the axillary nerve during this procedure. Although not dissected free, the axillary nerve is expected to be just deep and proximal to the tendon and the floor of the exposure, where the forceps is depicting. Here we also see that the teres major, which is deep and superior to the latissimus, has some intact fibers. Next, we plan for the placement of two cortical buttons. So the drill pin is used to place two holes around 10 to 15 millimeters apart, preferably at a slight angle to the flat cortex. The bone debris is irrigated. We then turn our attention to the tendon. We plan to pass two suture tapes through the tendon in simple locking crack out fashion in order to create four limbs that will be used through the two cortical buttons. The first suture tape is now passed through the tendon. The second suture tape is then passed in the same manner, in a simple locking crack out fashion. The two suture tapes are now both passed, creating four limbs as shown. The tendon is then repeatedly cycled to eliminate creep. Next, the first set of suture tape is loaded onto the button in standard fashion, with one limb entering proximally and exiting distally, and the other limb entering distally and exiting proximally, as shown. The button is then inserted in standard fashion according to the manufacturer's technique guide. Once inserted, the sutures are pulled on to ensure stability and that the button has flipped and is abutting the cortex. The second set of suture tape is loaded onto the button in the same manner and the button is inserted into the cortex. Again, a forceful pull confirms stability and that the button has flipped. Next, a free needle is used to pass one limb of each of the suture tapes from deep to superficial through the tendon. 
This allows for the knot to be tied on the superficial surface of the tendon after it is reduced to its footprint. This limb will also serve as the post limb for knot tying. Again, one limb of the other set of suture tape is also passed through the tendon in the same manner. Once the sutures are passed, they are tensioned, keeping in mind which strands of suture are the post strands as the tendon is reduced, and then suture tying is performed. An arthroscopic knot pusher is used to facilitate knot tension deep in the wound, as shown. The second set of suture tape is then also tied using the arthroscopic knot pusher. Once tying is complete and the tendon is reduced, the sutures are cut short with an arthroscopic cutter to prevent irritation. The latissimus tendon is now repaired to its footprint. The wound is then irrigated and closed in layers, with 3O vicryl for the dermal layer and a running subcuticular 4O monocryl for the skin. Sterile dressings are applied and the patient is placed in a sling. The following are the immediate postoperative x-rays, which show the well-placed cortical buttons abutting the cortex. Rehab begins with passive range of motion exercises at two weeks, followed by active range of motion at six to eight weeks postoperatively.